Hello, thank you for watching today. My name is Ben Haas. I'm a partner with Lathwin Watkins in the FDA Practice Group in Washington, D.C. And my name is Liz Richards. I'm also a partner in uh, Latham's FDA practice group in Washington, D.C. So, Liz, we're here today to discuss hot topics uh, in FDA laws and regulations. So another hot topic that I'm well aware of, and I'm sure you are as well, is, you know, FDA's efforts as of late to modernize the 510K pathway and the device regulatory pathway more generally. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I certainly think that artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, and algorithms fundamentally are the future of healthcare, at least when we think in terms of personalized medicine and allowing companies to facilitate you know, those types of products uh, for the end user. And it's an interesting policy issue or a hot topic because FDA's current scheme really isn't a fit with how these algorithms work. How so? For instance, traditionally, if you had a software-based program, you would obtain FDA clearance or approval for that algorithm as it was proposed in that draft such that the algorithm in our terms is called closed. Meaning anytime you then changed uh, the software, you had to go through an analysis to see whether you needed to go back to FDA for a separate clearance or approval. Now, when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, the beauty of these products is that they teach themselves in real time and often in a way that fundamentally shifts the algorithm, changes the software. So FDA is trying to fit this sort of static program, get approval, come back when you need to, to a program that learns in real time. Last year, FDA issued uh, some preliminary guidance on how they may ultimately regulate these products in a way that on the one hand facilitates a software developer or manufacturer's ability to innovate and develop new versions of permutations of a living, so to speak, algorithm, while upholding FDA's mandate to maintain the safety and efficacy uh, of these products. And I think when you really boil it down, it's providing FDA with assurance that from a manufacturing perspective, a validation and verification perspective, you know what you're doing, that you sort of achieve a gold standard as a software developer. And on a prospective basis, that you identify the various gates or the various triggers for an analysis of the changes in your algorithm over time. Um, ultimately, that would lead to a situation where the algorithm can operate as intended, uh, but there will be certain gates at which a manufacturer may need to go back to FDA to obtain a new clearance or approval. I think it's fascinating that FDA has clearly acknowledged the potential ability of these products to really revolutionize healthcare, um, while at the same time making sure that patients get the treatment they need. So, Liz, you know, part of the AI initiative is real world evidence, right? Um, can you tell me a little bit about that from FDA's perspective? Yeah, so FDA has recently put out um, a paper acknowledging the uh, utility of real world evidence and the data um, that's out there from medical records and, and other sources. And historically, FDA has really looked at that and in a post-market context from a safety perspective. FDA is acknowledging the potential for using those type um, of data and that information for regulatory purposes, for example, in the drug context, to support the submission of a supplemental new drug application for a new indication. Historically, FDA has not allowed very often for the usage of um, real-world evidence, you know, information in medical records and, and whatnot for uh, those types of purposes. It's really looked to controlled clinical trials, which it distinguishes from data that's collected in, in mm -hmm. the context of, you know, medical records, observational studies, et cetera. Very interesting. I, I think it's also notable that FDA is looking at these issues in the clinical trial space, which is where we spend a quite amount of time in our practice. Yeah. You know, historically, if you wanted to participate in a clinical trial, you had to show up at the clinic, you had to go right. through the informed consent process, make repeated visits, which can be quite onerous, especially for someone with a serious health condition uh, to participate. I know that FDA is looking at ways to facilitate the use of mobile technologies, telemetry, uh, biometrics, so that a subject can essentially participate in a clinical trial at home uh, and have those data transmitted to a clinic. So it'll be interesting to see how both from a approval, post-market and pre-market clinical perspective, how FDA policies evolve in these areas. Absolutely. Ben, it's been great speaking with you today on these hot topics. Always great to speak with you, Liz. And to you, the viewer, thank you for your time today. Rest assured that we stay on top of these hot topics. Follow the link below uh, to learn more.